Hi everybody, welcome. We, as you said, we are the All Strung Out String Quartet. And this is Ashley on first violin, Reagan on second violin, and Douglas on viola. And that was the Ashokan Farewell by Jay Unger. He's a great American folk musician. He was featured on the Ken Burns uh, PBS Civil War series. So you may have heard that before. So in this program today, we're gonna to play eight pieces, talking between each one to do questions and answers that will discuss string quartets and the instruments and our music. Uh, a list of what we're gonna play is over here, in case you're interested. I was thinking that. Okay, so the first question is, what is a string quartet? As the name implies, a string quartet has four instruments, traditionally two violins, a viola, and a cello. The first violin plays the melody most of the time and plays in a high voice. The second violin is the same instrument as the first one, but it usually supply, uh, plays supporting melody for the first violin. And the viola is a little larger, if you hold it up next to the violin, a little larger than a violin, has a slightly lower voice, and usually plays harmony that complements the violin. The cello, which is this one here, is the largest of the three instruments, and it has the lowest voice of the three. It also plays supporting melodies and occasionally has a melody too. Now some music pieces are written specifically for string quartets. These composers have a keen understanding of how to feature the best of each instrument's tonal capabilities and range, and they excel at blending the instruments. Our next piece is an example of this. It is the beautiful Nocturne from the String Quartet No. 2 by Alexander Borodin, a 19th century composer. This piece is twice as long as the other pieces that we're going to play, and it is one of our most challenging pieces that we play, so cross your fingers for us. <laughs> we're going to keep ours straight and try to play it for you. Uh, the theme for this was actually a a popular song in the 1940s as well. By the way, there are a couple of things you may notice while we're playing here. Um, one is we will retune our instruments between each of the pieces. And we need to do this because these are wooden instruments and they're sensitive to humidity and temperature changes and things like that. The other is due to wearing masks, um, Ashley will be counting out loud to get us going when we, when we start off. Usually she kind of just mouths with this. So here we go with the board then.
All cello players have a white mark on their knee right now. <laughs> on the rock. Okay. So, Douglas. All right, so how do these instruments make the sounds that they do? Is the next question. And we'll move this out of the way so I'll <coughs> So when you move your bow over a string, there's micro tiny little spikes on the bow hair that grab onto the spring and cause it to vibrate. That vibration is transferred via the bridge, which is this precisely carved piece of maple right here. There we go. <laughs> and that transfers the vibration to the top of the instrument. And then a wooden dowel, which is about this long, transfers that sound from the top to the back of the instrument. And the top and the back vibrate together to <coughs> amplify the sound. The F holes here, looks like an F, right? Uh, that allows air to move in and out of the body. All this together produces the sound. Actually, nearly every part of the instrument, including the fingerboard, which is this part here, and the end pin on a cello, um, all the parts, even the bow stick, all contribute toward the sound that, that comes out of the instrument. Now some pieces, like our next piece, <coughs> were written for a string instrument, I'm uh, sorry, for a string orchestra, and we adapted it for a string quartet. It is The Cliffs of War by Susan Day, an American contemporary classical music composer. Most of the time when we play our instruments, we're trying to play one string at a time. In this case, we're playing two at a time on purpose. <laughs> and that is actually called double stops when we do that. And, and in this piece, we're doing it to mimic bagpipes. Okay.
reason the cello is because it's bigger, everyone can see it. All right. Um, is it done? How do you play the various notes? Is the next question. So violins have four strings, E, A, D, and G, from high to low, and each a slightly different thickness. The higher the note, the thinner the string. Violas and cellos have four strings as well, but they're A, D, G, and C. When you press your finger down on a string, it shortens the string and produces a different note. So how do you know where to put your fingers? <laughs> Unlike guitars and some other instruments, there are no fret marks on these instruments. You learn through trial and lots of error where the notes are on the fingerboard. Eventually your brain and muscles remarkably just know where the notes are and you play the notes you want to. You may have noticed that we rock our fingers back and forth when we play a note. That is called vibrato. It is done to make a richer tone, just like people do when they, with their vocal cords when they sing. So Ashley, can you play a plain note for us and then do the same note with vibrato? Well, hopefully you can hear the difference there, how richer it sounds. Okay. Uh, our next piece is Yesterday, the famous Beatles song. Next question is, how are these instruments made? They are made uh, by craftsmen called luthiers, or luthiers, depends on where you're from. 
uh, the techniques and geometry of how to make a string instrument, one that sounds good, was worked out many hundreds of years ago. Modern instrument makers just follow these patterns worked out by the old masters. For example, for a cello, like this, this is a Stradivarius pattern. Um, there's, there was a Stradivarius pattern and a Montagnana pattern, for example, among others. The Stradivarius pattern is a normal size and produces a sweeter sound. The Montagnana pattern is slightly larger and produces a little deeper sound. So, like I said, this one's a Stradivarius pattern. It was made about two and a half years ago, not in 1700. <laughs> if it was, I'd be rich. Um, starting at the top, the scroll, which is this part here, and the neck, and the sides are all made out of maple. The top is made out of spruce. Oh, and the back is also made out of maple. Okay. Uh, my cello was made from um, European aged wood, over 75 years old. The fingerboard and the pegs usually, and the tailpiece usually, are made out of ebony. And uh, my, in my particular tailpiece is made out of a composite material. Uh, let's see. The bows are made out of real horsetail hairs that are bleached, preferably Mongolian horses. And the bows themselves were made out of Brazilian Pernambuco wood. Uh, if they're a wooden bow, or mine is made out of carbon fiber. And the strings are made out of stainless steel that's wound. So that's how you put together an instrument. Our next piece is A Thousand Years. This was a popular song a few years ago when the Twilight movies came out. It was sung by Christina Perry. Uh, we play it quite a bit faster than Christina sang it, since it was so slow that we were kind of falling asleep while we played it. So here we go.
the next question is, how much do these instruments cost? So while you can buy an instrument like a violin for $49 from Amazon, you don't want to. Decent student instruments cost many hundreds of dollars, and more advanced instruments are thousands of dollars and up. The old great instruments can cost millions. Why? Because their wood is so old and seasoned, and their dimensions are so perfect that they make a marvelous sound, and they are actually a joy to play. So while you can spend too little on an instrument, you basically cannot spend too much on one, and the bow too. How long does it take to learn how to play? Is the next question. You can be playing your basic Mary Had a Little Lamb in a couple days. How you progress from there depends on how much practicing you do each day. Um, all of us have been playing for many, many years. While you can teach yourself to play, it is highly recommended to take lessons from a teacher who will instruct you on the proper ways to play and to help you out with problems that you inevitably will have. Douglas here is a cello teacher, for instance. Okay, our next piece is a natural first string quartet. It is Beauty and the Beast from the Disney movie. Disney fans enjoy. Our next question is, how is it unique playing in a quartet? 
Playing in a quartet or other ensemble like this requires you to listen to the other players as well as yourself. Making sure that you stay together and are supporting each other. We are all orchestra members too, but we especially enjoy the intimacy and togetherness of a quartet, which is sometimes lost in a big orchestra section. You cannot hide in a quartet. <laughs> when do you, uh, where do we get our music? We happen to like a mixture of classical music and contemporary music. For much if not most of our music, we take a piece that interests us, figure out the four parts and put it in music software that helps us create the music for each of the four instruments. And there's a fair amount of free music out there on the internet. Some music was written for a string quartet, like the board in Rock Doctrine that we played earlier. The next piece, was not, and it is somewhat awkward fit. It is the famous Ave Maria by Franz Schubert. This is an adaptation for string quartet of a vocal piano duet. The violins and viola will actually be mimicking the sound of a harp.
So before we close with our last piece, are there any questions about quartets or these instruments or our music that we didn't cover? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, we will close with one of our favorite pieces, also a bit challenging to play. It's called the Eine Kleine Nacht music, which translated from German is A Little Night Music by Mozart. And we'll do a quick encore after that too.
Thank you all for being here and doing a fabulous job. 